I said that there's only really one way that divergence theorem can be made tricky, because divergence theorem is really not very tricky. You have a surface integral and turn it into a triple integral. Triple integrals are usually fairly easy to do, particularly if the region is uh, simple to define, which it often is in these cases. And the integrand of the triple integral is div f, and div f is often something pretty simple. So divergence theorem is really nice. It's a very convenient process to use. Um, but of course, it applies to closed surfaces only. Sometimes we have an open surface and it's really tempting to use divergence theorem. And we still can with a little bit of a twist. So first I'll just write a little paragraph and then we'll jump into a couple of examples. So we use the divergence theorem to turn a surface integral of a completely closed surface um, into a triple integral over the 3D region enclosed by that surface. Okay, in certain cases, if you could please keep quiet. The chatty latecomers coming in have probably brought us up to 40 people, so that's nice. In certain cases, we can use the divergence theorem. To turn, sure, words are long, symbols are faster. We can t to turn a surface integral of a not closed surface into a triple integral. Okay, oh, triple in integral, sorry, that came out rather funny. Into, ah, let me rewrite that. Curse it is something funny. <coughs> integral. The process, the process followed is to introduce a piece of surface to close the given surface. The process is to introduce a piece of surface, please keep quiet, you may not be interested, but the people sitting next to you might be. To close the given surface <coughs> and then to subtract the effect of that introduced surface at the end. This is not unlike that thing we did with the um, Green's theorem over a region where the P and Q were actually not defined at a point. And we actually introduced a little curve, which then increased the boundary of our region. And so then at right at the end, we needed to actually subtract out what was happening along that boundary. Um, now, in Green's theorem, that process is fairly obscure. In Divergence theorem, that process is actually quite common. But it's the same process, a similar process. To subtract the effect of that introduced surface at the end. Oh, at hello. Let's rub that out. At the end. Okay. Uh, the typical example of this is to have a hemisphere and to close it with a disk, a planar disk. There are other examples, but that's the typical one. The typical example of this is to have a hemisphere and close it with a planar 
disk, a piece of plane in the shape of a disk to sort of plug the open part of the hemisphere. Okay, and I'm going to demonstrate with a couple of examples. Uh, which ones again? Where are my notes there? Uh, 57 and 58. Okay, so in exercise 57, I have find the flux of F. So let's have a look. We've got F, and F is Z, Y, X squared. I can already see the div is going to be very simple indeed. Through the upper half of the sphere, upper half of the sphere, so a, a hemisphere. There it is. Uh, radius 1 centered on the origin. Okay. It would be really nice to use divergence theorem. Because the div is going to, because trip, it's a triple integral, it's a s hemisphere, we can, we can use spherical coordinates, be very easy to describe. My div is going to be 1, I can see that. Because it's going to be 0 plus 1 plus 0. So divergence theorem would be so, it's so tempting to use divergence theorem. But it's not actually appropriate because uh, the surface that's been described to us is an open surface. S is the hemisphere. And it's an open surface. It's not closed. So if we think of, um, well, I want to say the region enclosed by the hemisphere, but e even saying that is not correct, because a hemisphere doesn't enclose anything because it's open. But if you if you put a base on that hemisphere to turn it into a a plane, a piece of plane plus the hemisphere. Now you're enclosing a 3D region, and you can do <coughs> divergence theorem across that 3D region. But remember what divergence theorem says. It says that the triple integral of the div of f over that 3D region is equal to the, s the flux, basically, through the entire surface. So the hemisphere plus that, that disk base that you're putting on. And we only want to know the flux through the hemisphere. So we can totally use divergence theorem, but then at the end we need to come along and actually work out what the flux through the base is and take it out. So we are using divergence theorem to avoid doing a surface integral. We're not going to succeed entirely because we're still going to have to do a surface integral. We're going to have to do a surface integral on that disk base. However, it's going to be a simpler surface integral than the one that we started with, which is the surface integral over the hemisphere. The normal will be very easy. Um, yeah, the, the conversion factor will be very easy, and the fact that that disk is lying on z equals zero is probably also going to be advantageous. Okay, so here we go. Let S1 be the disk on z equals zero uh, bounded by S. Okay, so I'm introducing so S is the given hemisphere S1 is that disk base alright so we know that what do we know about that disk base we know it's sitting on Z equals 0 which means that it's horizontal so it's normal it's going to be very simple um, yeah we know it's got radius 1 so we know quite a lot about it. The flux through S union S1 is equal to the triple integral over E. Oh, I haven't defined E. I'm going to write here E is the solid region. Uh, div F dV. Okay. Uh, div f is just going to be 1. Can you see that? Because it's the derivative of z with respect to x, plus the derivative of y with respect to y, plus the derivative of x squared with respect to z. So it's 0 plus 1 plus 0. So just to be completely pedantic about it, my div is 0 plus 1 plus 0. So it's just 1. I can pull that 1 out. And in fact, I was talking about spherical coordinates, but we don't have to go there. Because I'll just be left with integral, integral, integral 1 dv. That is the volume of E. So yes, I can totally integrate using spherical coordinates, but I don't need to. I can just say it's 1 half of the volume 
of a sphere of radius 1. And that is what? 2 over 3 pi. Um, I beg your pardon? Cubed. In fact, it is cubed. N doesn't make a difference, but you're quite right, it is cubed. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, no. That was careless of me. Okay, alrighty then. Um, but of course, the flux through S union S1 is not what we want. We're wanting the flux just through S. So the flux through S is equal to the total flux minus the flux through S1. And that I'm going to have to work out. With the surface integral, there's no way to avoid it. So that's 2 over 3 pi minus surface integral. But you know what? That surface <coughs> is, <coughs> excuse me, is parallel to a coordinate plane. Yeah, it's lying on a coordinate plane, but in, it beca even if it wasn't lying on the coordinate plane, the fact that it's parallel to a coordinate plane means that the conversion factor is 1, and my S can turn into an R with no problem. That is both S1 and R at the same time. Here's X, here's Y, here's Y. <coughs> Uh, F is Z, Y, X squared. We're going to dot that with the normal now. The normal. Let me draw my normal onto this picture. The normal for S1 is <coughs> downward. Because if you read the wording of the divergence theorem, it's about the outward flux. We, or the entire, the, the surface, the boundary surface of your solid region has positive, in other words, outward orientation. So if we were going to draw little arrows onto the hemisphere, we'd draw them pointing up. But if we draw little arrows onto that disk base at the bottom, we have to point, draw them pointing down. So the N for S1 is 0, 0, minus 1. Outward, and because the disk is the bottom of the shape, outward means downward. And that will just be dA. You can talk about conversion factors if you want. The conversion factor will be 1. If you want to actually algebraically work out the conversion factor, remember that the surface of which S1 is a part is Z equals 0. And so when you work out the conversion factor, it's going to be square root of 1 plus 0 plus 0. But you can always remember, just as a base thing, if your surface is a plane that is parallel to one of the coordinate planes, your conversion factor will be zero. Think of the book held horizontal to the ground and how the shadow of the book has the same area as the book. Always assuming infinitely strong, <laughs> far away, point source, light, all of those um, impossibilities. So let's work that out. Um, And then when we do that, what we're going to get? We're going to get minus x squared. Minus x squared dA. Yeah, I'll keep it as dA for now. But I'm going to put that into polar coordinates. Uh, I'm going to bring the minus out. X, is, x squared is r squared cos squared theta. But I know the dA is r dr d theta. So altogether, I'll end up with an r cubed in there. Don't forget your Jacobian. Very easy to forget the Jacobian. R goes from 0 to 1. Theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. This is one of those cases where my integrand is the product of two functions, where one function is all about R and the other function is all about theta. My limits of integration are just constants. So this is one of those special cases where I can actually integrate simultaneously. As I've said before, if you don't trust yourself to be able to recognize that, then don't do it. Cos squared. Oh, bother. I did say that, didn't I? But now I'm going to have to use my cos double angle formula. 
Okay, all right, here we go. So let's have a look. I know that cos of 2 theta is 2 cos squared theta minus 1. Therefore, oh, thank you, stylus. Cos squared theta minus 1. Therefore, cos squared theta is that thing plus 1 over 2. I don't have space in my brain to remember that. I just don't. So I remember my cos double angle formula, and then I get it from there every time. You'd think after so many years I'd remember it? Mm -mm, I don't. I know there's a half involved, there's either a plus one or there's a minus one. I'm not exactly sure. I'll just do it from scratch every time. Um, so what's that? Cos squared, that's zero to two pi of one half cos two theta plus one d theta. Two thirds pi plus, what's that? That's a quarter. And there's the half. And then there's the, uh, what will that be? That'll be a half sine 2 theta plus theta from 0 to 2 pi. And of the four resulting terms, only one is non-zero. So that'll be a 2 pi. So that'll be a quarter pi. So I've got 2 thirds pi. I should be able to do this in my head. It'll be over 12, I'm tightening that by 4, so it's 8, I'm tightening that by 3, so it's 3. So it's 11 over 12 pi, am I right? If my fractions are correct. Oh, well, I agree with my notes, and that's always comforting. Okay, so what happened there in that whole problem as a whole? We were working out the flux. We were working out the flux <laughs> through a non-closed surface. So on the face of it, divergence theorem doesn't apply. However, our surface, even though it's not closed, is very easily closed with the addition of a fairly simple surface. Of course, you sometimes get really funny surfaces where you can't do that. I mean, I remember um, in, um, on several uh, occasions, we've had to work out flux through surfaces that look kind of like this, haven't we? And that sort of thing is, you can't close that very easily. You'd have to be really, you'd have to you have to add several surfaces to close something like that. And in a situation like that, you would just be stuck doing flux with a surface integral and you'd have no choice. Divergence theorem would not be available to you. But in this case, divergence theorem is available to us because even though our surface is not closed, we can easily close it by simply introducing an extra, very simple piece of surface. So we do that. We use divergence theorem, triple integral, we end, uh, we end up with a very simple little calculation. But we need to remember that the flux that that divergence theorem calculation is representing is a total flux through the surface that we're really interested in and the surface that we're not interested in. So we still need to go and work out the flux through the surface that we're not interested in and pull it out of our total. And by pull it out, I'm referring to that minus, basically, that's there near the top of the screen. Turned out we were subtracting a negative, so we ended up with a plus. But to start off with, we're subtracting. We're taking out the thing we got through the divergence theorem triple integral, and we're subtracting the flux that we don't want. Question? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you absolutely can. So uh, if, you, if you're wanting to work out the flux through that hemisphere, you don't have to use divergence theorem. But you can. So, so sometimes in an exam question, it'll actually say use the divergence theorem to solve it, and sometimes it won't. And if it doesn't, obviously, if it says that, we're wanting to see that you can use it, and that's what we're testing for. But mm -hmm. if there's a flux question and it doesn't say what method to use to solve it, up to you. If your surface is closable. Go ahead, use the divergence theorem. If you don't feel like it and you think flux questions, you've practiced 30,000 of them by this point, they're actually not that hard anymore, um, then don't use the divergence theorem. It really is up to you. That option's available. Any questions on that particular example? Mm -hmm. I'll, yes? It's parallel to the z-axis. So our... So you can get this normal here a couple of different ways. One, you can just get it by inspection. 
because you know that that disc is horizontal and its normal is parallel to the z-axis. And if your normal is parallel to your z-axis, then it'll be, and it's a unit normal, you'll know that it's either 0, 0, 1 or 0, 0, minus 1, or those are the only two options, and then you just need to think about direction because it's pointing down at 0, 0, minus 1. If you don't trust your ability to do things by inspection, you can simply work it out by knowing that the surface of which it is a part is z equals 0. And so if you work out the grad of this function, okay, I'm going to put a nice big bracket because there's nothing here. There's 0x plus 0y. The grad of that is 0, 0, 1. Of course, that's pointing in the wrong direction. You'd have to put a minus in front of it to flip it. Um, but you can algebraically get your normal from that plane by simply working out the grad. Whenever in a flux question, you use your surface equation and you, and you work out the grad of that surface equation in order to get your normal, there's always a time at which you need to pause and go, is it pointing in the right direction? What is the sign of my z component? Is it an upward pointing arrow or a downward pointing arrow? Is it the direction that I want? And that's the same here. OK, all righty then. Let me move on to the next example which is, um, losing track of the numbers, 58, which I think is very similar. Find the flux. Ah, look at that div. That div's going to be zero. And once again, we have a hemisphere of mystery radius A. <coughs> Okay, so I'm going to call that S, and once again I'm going to call the introduced disk at the bottom S1, and because S1 is not mentioned in the wording of the problem, I should say something about it. Let S1 be the portion of Z equals zero contained within or bounded by S. And I'm going to call my solid region A. Um, e. Okay, so flux, just like the previous one, flux through S union S1 is equal to integral, integral, integral E div F dv, which is equal to integral, integral, integral 0 dv, which is 0. <coughs> which means if we look at the hemisphere and the disk together, altogether there's net zero flux, which means as much is flowing in as is flowing out. However, we haven't been asked to look at that. We've only been asked to look at the flux through the hemisphere. So flux through S is equal to zero subtract flux through S1, which is 0 minus integral, integral, surface integral, but once again, the surface is parallel to a coordinate plane. So the surface integral completely unproblematically becomes a double integral. R, my flux is, oh, sorry, my velocity field is y minus x2. I'm dotting it with 0, 0, minus 1, just like before. Once again, I'll draw that normal onto the picture. There's the normal to S1. I say the normal. Of course, any plane, any surface has infinitely many normals. Even a plane has infinitely many normals. But it only has one downward pointing unit normal, and that's 0, 0, minus 1. My goodness, this is going to be a very easy problem. Not only was the triple integral just zero, the double integral that I've got here is just that. An integral, integral dA, is just the area of R, pi r squared. 2 pi. Oh, I wrote 1 onto my picture. I was wrong there, wasn't I? It's actually A. I apologize. 
previous problem was 1, this one is a. And there we go. 2 pi a squared, nice and easy. All right, how about you give it a go? How about you try the next two? Let me just see if I'm agreeing with my notebook here. Um, that one and that one, absolutely. You try 59 and 60. I'll write the answers up so that you can check yourself. <coughs> You know, it has an A and a B. Oh, A is just working out the div, uh, and then B is the flux, and then C is the flux. You'll notice as you look down these questions that it's hemisphere, 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 hemisphere all the time. And I've taken these questions from old tuts, but also from old tests and exams. Every now and again, you hit a different one, though. 63 is a cylinder. Okay, so it's not always a hemisphere. Um, 64 is a rather odd one. Where did I find that? I found that in an old tut somewhere, I think. It, it's a rather strange one. And 65 is a hemisphere again. And 66 seems to be a cylinder again. So every now and again, it's not a hemisphere, but mostly it is. Okay, answer, 59's answer is 124 over 5 pi. And 60's answer is pi. So I was just asked if you can have the situation where the piece of plane that you're artificially inserting into the problem is actually not parallel to one of the coordinate planes. And yes, you could. Um, and such a situation would be set up by the people setting the question, providing you with a surface that is an open surface and that is closable by an oblique plane. And such a thing is quite hard to describe. Um, so that would be making hard work for the person setting the question. Um, but we could do it. We could say something like, um, it's the, well, it wouldn't be a line, but we could say something like, um, it's the hemisphere it's the portion, so we could give you a sphere equation and say S is that portion of the sphere that lies above the plane y equals x, uh, sorry, y equals z. Because that would be a hemisphere. Of course, by doing so, we're giving you the plane that you would then need to use to plug it because it would be the one that's slicing through the sphere. So it could be something like that. And then, of course, when you get to this subtract out the flux you don't want part, you then have to do a, a legit surface integral where you'd have to do a projection story and a conversion factor. So we could give you something like that. Um, cylinder, possibly, as well. Cylinder that need to be. But once again, in order to describe the slopiness of the bit that you need to close, we would probably have to essentially give you that wide open hint in the question of what plane you'd then be using. So it's unlikely that we'd give you such a thing. I say we, um, I'm not setting any of the questions this semester, but we as the lecturing team, it's unlikely <coughs> that we would do that, but it, it is possible, it is within the realm of possibility that you could get a surface that's an open surface and that the way to close it is by inserting a piece of an oblique plane rather than one parallel to a coordinate plane.